Good morning, everyone. Hope you all had some coffee. Distinguished guests, we'd like to welcome you all to the second international conference on Tamil nationhood and genocide in Sri Lanka, a search for justice and post-war rebuilding of the Tamil nation. Chers invités, distinguished, nous voudrions vous accueillir à toutes à la deuxième conférence internationale sur la nation Tamil et le génocide au Sri Lanka, la quête de justice et la reconstruction de la nation Tamil après la guerre. Anaibarayim, inda kartar ngukku, varga varga vendra varavetu kundu, inda nigal chayi thodanga pogundu. Today's conference is to serve as a follow-up of the 1999 conference in Ottawa. It aims to study the current situation of the Elam Tamil nation and its political struggle, taking academical and organizational perspective, as well as to set goals for the Tamil struggle over the next decade. சர்வதேச ரீதியில் நடைபெறும் இந்த கருத்தரங்கு ஈழத்தமிழர்களுக்கு கிடைக்கப்பட்ட அநீதியை எவ்வகையில் உலகின் முன் கொண்டு வரலாம் என்ற அடிப்படையில் அமைகிறது L'événement aujourd'hui soutiendra la suite de la conférence de 1999 qui a lieu à Ottawa. La conférence visera à étudier la situation actuelle de la nation Tamil-Ilam et de ses conflits politiques, en prenant les perspectives académiques et organismes, ainsi que les objectifs à établir pour la lutte Tamil au cours de la prochaine décennie. The organizing committee of the second international Tamil conference consists of Brampton Tamil Association, National Council of Canadian Tamils, Mississauga Tamil Association, Ottawa Tamil Association, Quebec Tamil Development Association, Tamil Canadian C Civil Society Forum, and the Transnational Government of Tamil Elam. Le comité organisateur de la conférence consiste de Association Tamil de Brampton, cons uh, Conseil national des Tamils canadiennes, Association Tamil de Mississauga, Association Tamil d'Ottawa, Association de développement Tamil de Québec, Forum de la société civile canadienne Tamil et gouvernement transnational de Ilam Tamil Canada. Firstly, we'd like to begin our conference with the lighting of the peace lamp. We'd like to invite a representative from each of the organizing committee of the conference to come onto stage. Premièrement, nous inviterons, nous, nous aimerons débuter cette conférence avec l'allumage de la lampe de la paix. Nous aimerons inviter les représentants de chaque organisme de la conférence sur scène. Nous aimerons faire appel à, à tous ceux qui ont participé pour allumer la lampe de la paix. One of the cornerstones of this conference outcome is to educate our young generation about the struggle we face in achieving a permanent peace in Sri Lanka. We are thrilled to have the following university student organizations as supporting organizations of the conference. The supporting student unions are Carlton University Tamil Students Association, Wilfred Laurier Tamil Students Association, University of Ottawa Tamil Students Association, Tamil Youth Organization, Canadian Tamil Youth Alliance, Concordia T University Tamil Mundram and the Tamil Association of McGill. We now call one representative from each of these student organizations to join us on stage as well. L'un des objectifs de cette conférence est débuter nos d'évoquer nos jeunes gen, jeunes générations sur la lutte que nous devrons mener pour parvenir à une paix permanente au Sri Lanka. Nous sommes ravis que cette conférence est soutenue par les organismes étudiants suivants. Association étudiante Tamil de l'Université de Carlton, Association étudiante Tamil de Wilfrid Laurier, Association étudiante Tamil de l'Université d'Ottawa, 
l'organisme des jeunes tamouls, association des jeunes tamouls canadiennes, association Manjam étudiant tamoul de l'Université de Concordia et l'association étudiant tamoul de l'Université de McGill Tamil. Representatives of the organizing groups are requested to light the auspicious lamp. Are the MCs part of that photo op too? <laughs> Thank you. This is a three day conference and you'll be getting quite comfortable in a few minutes, but now if I may ask all of you to rise and remain standing for the next three items on the agenda. Now we'd like to commence with the honoring of the land in which we, the land which we call our current home. We commence our conference with an honoring of the, honoring of the indigenous peoples whose traditional lands we have been blessed to be part of and whose spirits we share. Today we have gathered and we see the cycles of life continue. We have been given the duty to live in balance and harmony with each other and all living things. So now we bring our minds together as one as we give greetings and thanks to each other as people. Now our minds are one. We would now kindly request everyone to remain standing for the singing of the national anthem by Sadhana Pathiban and Akshaya Sivasambhu. Following that would be the Tamil Thai Valtu, sung by Aravi Arasaratnam, Sadhana Pathiban and Akshaya Shambhugadasan. With glowing hearts we see thee rise, a true north strong and free. 
Ton histoire est une épopée, ses plus brillants exploits. Omni la pougale, soudan dirate, andomire ven katiruga. Oh, Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Oh, Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Thank you, ladies. We'll now have the Tamil Thai Walter. Thank you. Please remain standing for a moment of silence in memory of all the innocent lives who perished over the years in the genocide in our homeland, and in remembrance of all the brave soldiers who have given up their lives protecting their homeland in Canada, Tamililam, and around the world. <laughs> பொதுமக்கள் நினைவாகவும் தமிழீழ விடுதலைக்காக தமது உயிரை ஈகையாக்கிய போராளிகள் நினைவாகவும் மற்றும் கனடாவிலும் உலகெங்கிலும் விடுதலைக்காக தமது உயிரை துச்சமாக மதித்து போராடி வரும் போராளிகள் நினைவாகவும் சில நிமிடம் மௌனம் சாதிப்போம்
Thank you. And that concludes the exercise portion of the conference. You may all be seated. கருத்தாடலை செய்வது என்பது சுலபமான விடயம் அல்ல இந்த கான்பரன்ஸுக்கு தனது நேரத்தை மட்டும் செலவு செய்யாது உயிரையே கொடுக்கிறார் என்று சொல்லலாம் அந்த அளவுக்கு இதில் ஆழமாக பணிபுரிந்த ஒருவரை நாங்கள் மேடைக்காலைக்கு போகின்றோம் Please help me welcome the conference coordinator, Mr. Bennett Marianayagam, to do the welcome speech. Hope everyone is doing very well. Despite the high winds, power failures, and delayed travel plans, here we are today. Distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen, hello, Rukumenadiniya Kale Vanakango. It is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to the second international conference on Tamil nationhood and genocide in Sri Lanka. With painful memories and deeply wounded emotions, today we begin this conference right at the same place where nearly 20 years ago, a group of young Tamil University students hosted the inaugural international conference on Tamil nationhood and search for peace in Sri Lanka. Over the next three days, we have a full agenda to seek advice from experts in fields in ethno-nationalism and human rights atrocities. This second conference is held at a critical time when Tamil people in Sri Lanka and the Tamil diaspora is looking for direction to continue our struggle in search of peace with justice. To our eminent speakers and researchers who have come around from around the world, I bid you a warm welcome to this city of Ottawa. We are indeed honored to have you here with us. A special note to Ms. Anuradha Mittal, Executive Director of Auckland Institute, and Professor Richard Mann, Associate Dean of uh, Carlton University's Arts Faculty, for accepting our invitation to be the keynote speakers. We invite all of you to teach us with what you know as the fruit of your experience and the many hours of research that relate to these conference themes in trying to elucidate the mysteries of human confrontations. Let us bring back the old spirit of the scientific research to our ears when our community is tired of hearing political bandwagons and failed promises. After all, as the great American president Charles Meyer once said, the safest thing for a patient is to be in the hands of a man engaged in teaching medicine. We hope your words and call for action will soothe our pain and drive our energy to actively search peace with justice that's so far been elusive in our homeland. Nearly nine months ago, when we decided to organize this conference, we had doubts whether we had the energy to pursue this conference of this magnitude. But the Tamil community rallied behind us, opened their hearts, and supported us generously. Parents engaged their young children to join us as volunteers. This conference would not have been possible without the full support of the Tamil community and the organizing organizations who supported collectively with us. They gave us the needed energy to push this through. By gathering here today, you not only showed your support, but also extended your deeds with action. From deep down, Mananmaraidan Unreal. I take this opportunity to thank all the people who, especially all the people with, with us, who especially journalists who have been helping us over the years for fight for justice. 
I am honored and pleased to be the chair of the organizing committee. It's been a stimulating experience to work with a very talented group of people. I would like to express my thanks to each of you um, for your dedication, perseverance, and untiring efforts to make this international conference a reality. We take, we take immense pride in seeing so many young minds among us today. By seeing your engagement and enthusiasm, we feel passing the flame of peace to the next generation is very realistic. I hope the memories of this conference will stay with you for years to come. We are standing in the path of something unstoppable, the road to justice for Tamils. The road ahead will be crowded, contested, and uneven, just like it has been. Our wish is that we will exchange experiences, learn and be inspired to work even harder to achieve our objectives. Most importantly, take back the memories you have and the knowledge you gained and support the future efforts in finding peace, permanent peace with justice for Tamils in our homeland. To try is worthy, to be hopeful is right, to be idealistic is wise. Muyachi Thirivaniyakum, Nambi Kei Vetti Naritalam, Lachya Thodi Rupadu Engal Vivaham. Thank you. Merci. Thank you, Mr. Marinayum. Supporting institutions for this conference are the Faculty of Arts and Science, the Faculty of Arts and Social Science at the Carleton University, Colin Powell School for Civic and Global Leadership at City College in New York, as well as the School of Arts at York University. It is crucial that the efforts and commitment of all of these organizations are extremely integral to or it is crucial to recognize the commitment of all these supporting organizations, student unions, and the organizing groups. Without their support, such a grand and important conference will not take place. It is important to note that the efforts and engagement of all these organizations are integral factors of this conference and conference and reflect the unity reinforced in the community of Tamil. The Tamils have taken an active role in, advo in advocating for their community by taking part in conference with the United Nations Human Rights Council, while pressing for justice regarding war crimes and war against humanity committed in May 2009. For the past several decades, many conferences have been organized periodically, consisting of Tamil leaders such as Mr. Kumar Ponambalam, Mr. Joseph Pararaja Singham, and Mr. Taraki Sivar Sivaram whom had participated in the previous international conference and have now been permanently silenced by the Sri Lankan government. In present, in present day, the Sri Lankan government has been stalling and using tactics to postpone the implementation of the Human Rights Council resolution, which called for a hybrid mechanism to invest war crimes. However, there has been no government action regarding this resolution. As part of this structural genocide, the military occupation for Tamil's ancestral land is ongoing. On top of that, there is still the ongoing deliberate settlement in Sinhalese, of Sinhalese in the Tamil homeland. With that being said, there is also the building of Buddhist temple with the aim of occupying Tamil, Tamil's land where the majority are Hindus, Christians, and Muslims. And with that, the Tamil diaspora has come together to organize an international Tamil conference in Ottawa, the capital city of Canada. Throughout this conference, we will be focusing on five different yet related themes. The first theme is being Singhala Buddhist Etho Nationalist and its consequences. The second theme is a genocide by another name. The third theme is human right violation and the search for justice. The fourth theme is rebuilding a nation in today's geopolitical context, and the fifth theme is way forward to freedom and justice. We would like to now introduce our keynote speaker, Ms. Anuradha Mittal from Oakland Institute. 
Anuradha Mittal is the founder and executive director of the Oakland Institute and is an internationally renowned expert on trade, development, human rights, and agricultural issues. She has authored and edited numerous books, had her articles and opinion pieces published widely in widely circulated newspapers such as the New York Times and the Chicago Tribune. Anuradha has Anuradha re led the research at the Oakland Institute, including field research in eastern and northern provinces of Sri Lanka in December 2014, which led to the first independent report on human rights situation, especially as it, is, as it relates to the land rights of the Tamils. The Institute's report, The Long Shadow of War, The Struggle for Justice in Post-War Sri Lanka, and an accompanying report, I Speak Without Fear, where, where are our loved ones who have been abducted, arrested, and disappeared, created a media storm, and the issue of denial of justice for Tamils in Sri Lanka was on the front pages of every major newspaper following the release of those reports. Now, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome our keynote speaker for this morning, Anuradha Mittal. Thank you all. Um, it is um, deeply humbling to be here. Um, I know the topic uh, for the conference is incredibly deeply personal to most in the room. Um, and then there are individuals like Francis Boyle, Francis Harrison, um, amazing people, and many of you who have been working for justice and peace in Sri Lanka as members of the international community. So somebody standing here to give the keynote, I feel humbled and honored. And I think the best would be to actually start with a confession. I was born and raised in India. I'm from the north of India. As a young university student, I was politically very active. Television, I would hear about the struggle in Sri Lanka, but as a politically active student, it was never something I was engaged in. Uh, being a North Indian, told over and over again a certain discourse, you just believed it. So I stand here with shame. I also have to say um, it is very exciting to see all the young people who walked up here. And... Um, I'll tell you how my journey started. It was actually young members of British Tamil Forum, uh, especially Senthan and Raj Kumar, who contacted me and said, you work on land issues around the world. How come you're not working on Sri Lanka? And that put me on this path, which brought me in December 2014 to eastern and northern provinces. It helped to have a name like Anuradha when they could give me a military clearance to go into areas where you could not go because the person who gave me um, the permit to go said he really liked my name, Anuradha. <laughs> so having said that, um, I have to also say, as somebody who's worked on land issues in many different parts of the world, it, this journey has been a life-changing experience. Uh, what I witnessed, what I personally saw, is something that uh, would be impossible to forget. So I think I stand here with humility because you said you will teach us, but I have to tell you what you have taught me. And I would urge and hope, especially the younger generation, that this struggle continues, not just for the Tamils. This is an international human rights issue. If there is no justice for the Tamils in Sri Lanka, we cannot expect justice for other communities around the world. So carry this flame of justice, carry this flame of uh, striving for peace with justice for everyone in this world. So with that, I'll share with you um, my remarks, which are really based on the research, as I mentioned, that included spending time with the communities on the ground, but also our continued regular communication with the community, especially the internally displaced people, um, yes, IDPs, which still remain in Sri Lanka. Um, 
When we embarked on this work in 2014, the goal was to understand the social, economic, and political reality in northern and eastern provinces since the conclusion of the Civil War. Our findings were absolutely stunning, which led to the expose that was mentioned, the long shadow of war, uh, the goal being to really support the struggle for justice and peace in Sri Lanka. And as I said, it was important to share because this is not just a Tamil issue, this is really an international issue. Uh, during the course of these next few days, uh, there are many horrors of that war and the continued consequences that will be talked about. But I'm going to focus on the issue of land. What we found was that one of the biggest consequences of the war was the dispossession of people, especially Tamils, from their homes and lands that they depended on for their livelihoods. And land remains a highly contentious issue between the local Tamil population and the Sri Lankan army. Forced to vacate their homes, farmlands, fishing zones, um, once areas were designated as high security or restrict, uh, restricted zones, or by war itself, the displaced had hoped that the right to return would be granted someday. But continued military occupation has kept tens of thousands away from their homes and livelihoods, with over 10, 100,000 living in refugee camps still in India, which is not recognized. Between 2015, when uh, President Sirisena was elected, and the end of 2016, an estimated 4,780 acres of land were reportedly released, and there were pledges for more releases of land. However, estimates are really hard to come by about how much land is still occupied. I know there are some of you, Darsha and uh, Mario and others have been trying to document, but being on the ground actually documenting is very hard and impossible. Um, following the release of a 2015 report, um, we were contacted in early 2016 and actually petitioned by a group of IDPs who were requesting assistance in the struggle to return home. They wrote, and I quote them, having exhausted all the domestic, political, and legal avenues available to us to regain our lands and houses acquired by force by the Sri Lankan armed forces during the war. We, the people of Valikam North in the Jaffna district of Sri Lanka, have decided to seek your help to find redress to our problem. After over 25 years of displacement, having exhausted all possible political and legal channels, in an attempt to get the land back, the internally displaced living in so-called welfare camps were forced to petition an international civil society group to seek assistance. They urged us not to publish the names of the signatories because they were afraid of retaliation for contacting an international organization, and they reported, we get calls from unidentified telephone numbers from people who threaten us to stop the IDP and resettlement-related work. So they were asking for protection and yet asking after 25 years the right to be able to return to their homes. Um, I'm glad to report in 2017 we got the good news that their lands were released. Um, but the question is the quality of the lands that the people have been resettled is very low. These are former stone quarries, decades of overgrowth, homes, actually have been destroyed, so people are being sent back to just vacant lands. There are no homes, and in fact, in some cases, homes are destroyed just before the lands are released. Uh, irrigation canals need to be cleared. Electricity and access to clean water is not there. Uh, this is the kind of release that has been reported to us. And just this May 3rd, we got another message from our partners, uh, this group of people um, who were resettled um, just last year. They said our village has been fully released after 28 years for resettlement. However, another 3,100 acres of land belonging to neighboring villages need to be released. They also reported that the government is providing permanent houses, but with very strict criteria. If elderly couples or if they're single uh, people, government does not provide permanent houses. So they're struggling to manage the shelter needs. They also report that the lands are just released without cleaning, so the cleaning of land consumes huge amount of money. Families are struggling. Restoring livelihoods is a big issue. The released lands are next to big military camps. 
So women-headed households are not willing to go back to the areas where the lands have been released. And given the history of violence, especially the kind of violence women have faced, it is not surprising whether women-headed households will not move back to the lands that are next to the camps. Uh, for those who have been resettled through government schemes, the process has often taken place without voluntary or fully informed uh, settlement choice and without adequate infrastructure. In our report in 2016, Waiting to Return Home, we reported on those displaced from Sampur being sent back to live in the shadows of the new Navy camp, built close to the old camp and on paddy land, which was previously owned by the people. Having a Navy camp so close to the village is a major security concern for the locals who have faced harassment, violence, abuse at the hands of the Sri Lankan army over the years. The new naval camp has also restricted villagers' access to the sea as well as to the ponds, which are the traditional livelihoods fishing. The Navy has also converted a Hindu temple near, uh, into a Buddhist one in the same area. At the same time, people are being asked to resettle when there's no infrastructure available. So this is called resettlement, projects that are financed by institutions like the World Bank, and they can do check off and say resettlement done. <clears throat> Another key thing that I would want to touch upon, uh, which was a part of our findings, was it's going to be next year a decade since the end of the war but the North and the East continue to be under very heavy military occupation. So despite the end of the war, military budget has continuously increased, including since when Surusena was elected in, uh, so in 2008, the percentage of Sri Lanka's overall budget that was spent on military was 12.9%. In 2016, seven years after the war and a year after Surusena was elected, it was close to 15%. In 2015, we reported that an estimated one army personnel for every six civilians. Figures from last year research that was uh, put out again by, I believe, Darsha is here and also Mario, um, that just in Malatevu alone, at least 60,000 army personnel are stationed. 60,000 army personnel. That basically means one soldier for every two civilians in Malatevu. This does not even include, according to them, Navy and Air Force troops, and I hope they'll share more about their research. The Army has expanded non-military activities and is engaged in large-scale property development, construction projects, and other business ventures, such as travel agencies, farming, holiday resorts, and restaurants in the northern and eastern provinces. The Army officially runs luxury resorts. I had personally never seen seven and nine star hotels. They're run by the Sri Lankan Army in the northern and eastern provinces. And golf courses that have been erected on land that has been seized now from um, internally displaced peoples. Tourists can actually book holidays in luxury beach resorts, such as Thalsevna res Resort, which is functioning under the security forces headquarters by directly calling reservation numbers at the Ministry of Defense. In 2014, when you went to the website of Thalsevna, it was not very much, and I was mentioning to Francis yesterday, now when you go check out the website for Thalsevna Resort, it is fancy, it is professional. They are actually declaring to the world that this is a resort which is run by the Sri Lankan Army, close to the beach in Jaffna, where you can have an amazingly incredible exotic holiday, a place where the chief minister cannot enter, it is on the lands of the people that has been taken away, and they do so with absolute impunity. This appropriation of land is very significant to understand, given the long history of marginalization of the Tamil population, which has involved violence and pogroms and repressive laws and a government-orchestrated colonization of northern and eastern parts of the island nation. In the decade following independence in 1948, the takeover of land and displacement started via so-called development schemes, irrigation schemes, which colonized the Tamil lands through the settlement of hundreds of thousands of Sinhalese brought from southern parts of the country. Post-war takeover of lands has continued for tourism and industry and so-called development activities to create livelihoods for local populations, but with complete disregard for legitimate residential and livelihood concerns of those inhabiting the areas. Pasikuda Hotel Project in Batikalawa 
is only one such example where the land initially taken over by the government during the war was subsequently included in the Pasikada tourist zone by the Tourism Development Authority in 2012 without consultations, without compensation, and without any resettlement of the people and communities who were initially displaced from those lands. Another emblem of the signalization of the North and the East that we reported are the numerous victory memorials, often with plaques in Sinhala and English only. In uh, Pudumathalan, in Malaytivu War Her Hero Memorial in Kokaville, Victory War Memorial in Kilinochi, Kilinochi Water Tower, the terrorist bulldozer at the Elephant Pass, the War Hero Memorial close to the Indian uh, Jaffna Lagoon. All these monuments at iconic locations send a strong message of the complete Sinhalese takeover of the Tamil land. The Sri Lankan army maintains the monuments which are visited by the Sinhalese tourists. They run the kiosks uh, that sell snacks and soft drinks. And as an outsider, it was interesting to basically also follow the, the discourse, the discourse of victory of good over bad, the, the victory of the courageous soldiers over the coward terrorists, and it is constantly the presence of these institutions in Tamil lands which are being visited by the Sinhalese to constantly send a message of marginalization and complete defeat. Um, I'm not a psychologist. I cannot imagine the implications of these institutions that have been put up, and especially on your own land. Um, I could go on. I feel like there are many of you in this room who know so much more. Um, but having offered some of our findings, what is stunning is that we are here today. We know that the international experts and organizations have called for the complete demilitarization of the North and the East and the swift return of the land to the rightful owners to ensure peace and stability. Without the return of lands, there will be no peace and justice because land, uh, which I, you understand it much better than I could explain, the meaning of that land for the Tamil populations that are still there is much more than just having a sense of property. It is about the nationhood, it is about culture, it is, it is everything as we were told, the research team was told over and over again. And despite the rhetoric of truth and justice and reconciliation, the current government does not plan to scale down security arrangements. Uh, despite the United Nations resolutions and various task forces and numerous government promise, uh, promises, tens of thousands continue to live in despair and in fear in Sri Lanka. And despite all the promises that were made by President Sirisena when he came into power, the need for full resettlement and a true reconciliation process is unchanged. It is quite embarrassing for the international community, that the United Nations gave two-year extension to Sri Lanka to report on transitional justice mechanisms, despite little to no progress to date. So the response of the international community has to keep giving an extension, hoping that somehow Sri Lankan government will get its act together and not once doubting its political will if it intends to do so. At the same time you have in 2016 when Sirisena said in an interview with the newspaper in India, The Hindu, before I came to power there was a fear that those who had given commands during the war could be taken to international courts of justice. The international community is so satisfied with my performance that they have completely changed the impression of the country. Now there is no threat of international courts. I have told the international community that I cannot accept any proposal that allows for foreign judges to probe our domestic uh, matters. This is another great victory I was able to achieve in this time. You had the Minister of Justice warning that anyone alleging that Sri Lankan forces committed war crimes would face legal action. At the same time as the good work done by ITJP has reported, torture continues and is routinely practiced all over the country. ITJP's work has brought forward horrific evidence of torture and sexual violence perpetrated by Sri Lankan security forces, not before 2009, but that it continues today. The government has acknowledged finally that 65,000 people remain missing. But of course, we know the numbers are almost double of that. Uh, one of the things which was uh, something I was not prepared for when I was uh, in the East and North, that somehow the word got out that there's somebody taking testimonies.
that was the time when Sri Lanka was very clear that nobody could enter and go to the north and take testimonies. And I would be shocked, starting at 7 in the morning, there would be lines of people snaking around where I was to be able to show photos of their loved ones, the paperwork through the Red Cross that these people had surrendered, asking, can you help us find out where they are? This is a question that needs to be asked of the international community. The fact that in the face of such horrific violations of human rights, in the face of continued displacement of people, in the face of continued torture and absolute impunity of the Sri Lankan forces, how does the international community, how does the government of United States, United Kingdom, Canada and elsewhere, for the narrow geostrategic interest, believe that the situation is different in Sri Lanka. There has never been justice for victims of mass atrocities, whether it is Rwanda, whether it is Cambodia. And are we going to allow Sri Lanka to become another one? Because if we do, we, can, we know which way uh, the fate of the Rohingyas or whether the fate of Syria. So this is really a call to action to each one of us to stand up for what's right, not because it's too far away, the island nation. It has to be as much of a concern for me when I come from India, because that is happening in my own country in Kashmir. So till we stand up for each other, it will never, ever be resolved, and we will continue to write books and produce reports. Lastly, I would just say, it is up to each one of us. Yes, we need to do advocacy. We need to do advocacy at the United Nations, which at times feels like a fig leaf only, because all the politics are controlled by the United States and UK and France and all these powerful countries. This work has to continue. I know it is starring. I've realized you need legs of a marathon winner. You know, in the message that we received on May 6 from our partners, the internally displaced peoples in Sri Lanka, they said you need to continue advocacy. You need to continue advocacy in international areas to ensure that people know what is happening. And while we are doing it, every magazine which carries a story about the tourist destination being Sri Lanka, write to them. Let them know that when they go to the south, how about try to go to Jaffna, which feels like the war got over yesterday. But the roads and infrastructure is still not there. Ask the tourists to not just go to the elephant orphanages, but go to the welfare camps that still exist just near Jaffna. You don't have to go very far. So every time somebody writes about the tourist destination, there's a great campaign to be done around the World Bank, which has been sending money to Sri Lanka to be able to do resettlement project. Question what kind of resettlement is actually being carried out because it is finally the taxpayers' money that finance the schemes of the World Bank. All the clothing agencies and your retailers who want to set up factories and then they say we are providing employment to war widows. More than petty jobs that pay menial wages, war widows need justice. They need to have their loved ones back. They need to be safe. The number of women that I met who say that the police still visits them in the evenings. To uh, let them know they've come in the evening to talk to them about the missing loved ones. The fear. So I'm sorry, I feel like I had nothing very um, informational to share or any teachings. But I know I learned so much from each one of you when I started this journey in 2014. Thank you for having educated me. I just make one promise at the Institute and personally as an Arada. I'll keep working for peace and justice in Sri Lanka because that is needed for the region. And hopefully when there's peace and justice in Sri Lanka, there'll be peace and justice in India because we would have learned a lesson how to be in Kashmir. Thank you. It certainly was inf informational. It definitely was informational, and it was poignant and very inspiring. What a great way to kick off uh, this conference with that keynote speech. And a round of applause for Anuradha Mattel. Next, we, would, we will be sharing a video of uh, Muan Zarin, 
Uh, Mohan Zalni, he's a advocate, he's a democ democracy advocate, Rohingya campaigner, and a former research fellow at the London uh, School of Economics. He lives and worked in the uh, in United States for 17 years. In 1995, he founded a Free Burma Coalition and was its director until 2004. Let's watch the video. While that is getting set up, uh, just a friendly reminder and a note for everyone to uh, please write down and remember, kindly refrain from photos or videos, especially with your cell phones during the sessions. Uh, we do have professional photographers and videographers recording everything and all of that will be available for you. Uh, on the conference site. So kindly refrain from doing photos or videos with your own devices. And of course, if you can put your phones on silent or vibrate, that would be great as well. morning or good evening, whatever the time is. Um, I'm really sorry that I cannot be there in person. I really wanted to, but my uh, schedule got um, reshuffled a bit, and so I, I'm, I'm unable to uh, come there uh, to join you, show my solidarity in person. Um, I've always been an admirer of um, the Elam Tamil struggle for um, self-determination, ethnic equality in Sri Lanka. And uh, I have stood by uh, your struggle, um, even you know when your um, armed resistance was um, uh, defeated. I stayed uh, in solidarity with the Tamil people, you know, irrespective of what happened. Of course, you know and nobody wants to see bloodshed and violence, uh, but, but that's just a, a small part of your struggle, as I understand it. I served as a a member of the uh, panel of jury in Bremen at the um, Permanent People's Tribunal on Sri Lanka, the second tribunal that looked at the question of um, whether the state of Sri Lanka committed um, the crime of genocide against Elam Tamil people, uh, not just the war crimes. And the war crimes uh, you know, it was decided on at the, the first uh, Prominent People's Tribunal in Dublin in 2012, I believe, and I was with the uh, second tribunal uh, that found the state of Sri Lanka uh, the guilty of the crime of genocide in addition to war crimes that was held in Germany, uh, Bremen. And so I heard um, harrowing testimonies of people who lived through the last phase of the war, uh, including some Canadian doctors, uh, Tamil doctors who went to help. Uh, there are people in Jaffna and other places who uh, are, are trying to just simply stay alive in the face of um, uh, relentless and ruthless um, you know, uh, bombardment and, and, and massacres by the Sri Lankan army. But, you know, I, I have to say this um, because the, the, um, in this day and age, um, struggles for self-determination or even ethnic equality within a um, you know, single nation state that is uh, 
ethnically controlled uh, by usually majoritarian racist uh, groups, whether it's uh, Sri Lanka, uh, you know, Buddhist Sinhalese, or in my own country of Burma or Myanmar, where the Burmese uh, Buddhist majority are in sync uh, with the, the Burmese military um, that have been their main oppressor uh, over the last 50 years. As you know, the, um, uh, the Rohingya people, um, you know, simply because they happen to be Rohingya and they happen to be in an area the Burmese military consider very strategic to them, and to the, they have been misframed as Islamic terrorists, uh, supporters, uh, they've been mis misframed as proxies for Bangladesh uh, that uh, the Burmese military fears might snatch the ancient Arakan uh, coastline um, in order to relieve itself of population um, uh, uh, pressure from the high density of 166 million. And so, you know, I, I, I'm from a Buddhist um, uh, Burmese um, majority background, and I, I came from an extended military family that in, um, I have served in the, uh, the Burmese Armed Forces since its foundation, or its inception in 1942 under the fascist Japanese patronage. And, uh, you know, although I'm Buddhist Burmese and, and myself, um, you know, with the extended military background, I don't go with uh, patriotism, you know, blind patriotism that makes people uh, go with, um, behave like herds. Uh, behave like a part of a pack and so my country wrong is wrong and I'm not going to support my country and therefore I have been declared enemy of the state and I'm possibly the most uh, hated person uh, by the Burmese racist public uh, that calls itself Buddhist and commits and the Chia leads a genocide against Rohingya. So in, you know, I, I draw a parallel between what the um, uh, Sinhalese, uh, the public that calls itself Theravada Buddhist, and our two countries, uh, Sri Lanka or Salo and Burma or Myanmar, have a long centuries old ties, and and most disturbing, disturbingly, these two Theravada Buddhist countries are now uh, credibly accused of committing crimes against humanity, genocide, and war crimes. That is, all the um, you know. Um, uh, legally defined international crimes. And so the, these Buddhist societies must reclaim their good selves and they must stop any form of atrocities, the least of which is a religious bigotry and state-sponsored discrimination and persecution against either Hindu or other Tamil people or the uh, Muslim Rohingyas or Kachin uh, Christian. As you know, like the, the Burmese army is also uh, committing war crimes against the uh, Christian Christian people uh, near the uh, Chinese Burmese border of um, you know northernmost part of uh, Burma as I speak today. So I think my final message is that you know the United Nations, uh, starting with the Security Council, uh, permanent five uh, uh, members, have failed all the oppressed people of the world over and over again. We have, you know, they have turned this slogan, never again, uh, into empty, poor taste joke if you, are, if you belong to an oppressed minority in a racist, majoritarian, uh, you know, uh, post-independent but uh, you know, colonial states uh, such as uh, Sri Lanka today and Myanmar under Aung San Suu Kyi and uh, the Burmese military. So I think that the, you know, the, the key is we cannot look to these uh, states uh, that are created by us humans to come to our rescues. We must actually uh, collaborate among the oppressed people horizontally. In other words, we must lend uh, a hand of solidarity to whoever uh, is in distress, whoever is in in uh, oppression. And finally, I think uh, you know uh, all struggles and, and resistance movements are all well and fine, necessary, and we we, we need to keep um, uh, keep up with our struggle, keep on uh, trying to reestablish uh, broken communities. But at the end of the day, uh, we must also seek um, you know ways to reconcile with. Um, those who oppress us, uh, whatever they are, whoever they are, wherever they may be. 
that at, you know, at the end of the day, we have more in, com in common um, as humans across uh, religions, faiths, culture, and, and uh, national uh, identities. So my, my message is twofold. Um, we seek to establish solid solidarity movement uh, and movements uh, across the world, and at the same time, we seek to retain our own humanity. We don't become like our oppressor. We, at, at any cost, uh, we seek uh, uh, reconciliation, even with our oppre oppressor, when the oppressive group uh, is ready to um, uh, meet us halfway. And thank you very much, and have a wonderful uh, conference. It's too bad that Mr. Muang Zarni isn't here with us uh, at this conference, but what a passionate speaker. All right. So today's conference will consist of four sessions. Session one would be ethno-nationalism and its consequences in Sri Lanka. Session two, human rights violations and the search for justice. Session three, genocide by another name. And session four is diaspora resources and responsibilities. You guys will, will be, you guys must be all hungry by now. So there will be a lunch break between session two and three and a moderated discussion at the end of session four. Uh, also at the end of the day, today we will also have a special event at Oliver's Pub. There will be uh, tickets sold at the registration desk, but there are only 50 tickets available, so first come, first serve. Did you say pub? <laughs> okay. It's after the conference, okay? Don't rush to the pub yet. I also wanted to add another quick note to what um, she just said. There are no formal breaks in between sessions, but uh, there will be a few minutes at the end of the first session for you to just stretch and grab yourself a drink or you know, refresh yourself a little bit. But the sessions will be happening one after the other. Um, like I said earlier, please refrain from using your cell phones for photography or videography and kindly put them on silent or turn them off altogether, if you could. In addition, NLA Express, uh, one of our video services here, will be live streaming this event, as well as holding interviews outside in the lobby area throughout the day. You may let loved ones know that uh, they can watch this live, watch this conference live through the live feed. If you're interested in talking to us, you may meet us at the lobby. That is not just me and her, uh, the organizing committee, that is. Go on. Right. Outside, you will see an exhibition displayed, uh, displaying artwork, photography, and book relating to the theme of today's conference, uh, being provided by Canadian Tamil Youth Alliance. We would also like to inform you that they have provided you all the programs, souvenirs, um, and consist event details, the programs for the two days of the conference, and bio of all speakers. Now, without any further delay. No, oh, go ahead. You folks are a tough bunch. Lighten up, please. We're trying to crack jokes here. Clearly not working. Uh, before we actually move into the rest of the conference, I wanted to take a moment uh, to say this. We'd like to take this opportunity to recognize a particular organization that has made an invaluable contribution to the process of truth-telling, which, which is precursor to accountability. The Journalists for Democracy in Sri Lanka, or JDS as they're known, is a group of exiled journalists who have risked their safety to bring out some of the most important and shocking evidence of war crimes such as the C4 execution videos and the Balachandran photographies, photos. And what's striking is that this is a predominantly serious group of journalists. So maybe to a round of applause, let's recognize the work JDS and their allies have done. 
Now you go. Now it's my part. Okay, perfect. So now, without any further delay, we will begin the second international conference of Tamil nationhood and genocide in Sri Lanka, a search for justice and post-war rebuilding of the Tamil nation. I thought we already started, no? <laughs> We're starting again. Please help us welcome the chair of our first session, Dr. David Rampton, to carry on the conference forward. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm chair of the um, first panel, um, and what I intend to do is, first of all, to introduce um, participants uh, in the first panel, um, and then um, I will speak, um, followed by Peter Schalk, uh, uh, and then Anne Gall, um, Nimi Gaurunathan, uh, and then I believe we have a video link um, with uh, um, Kumara uh, Vadivel Guruparan from Jaffna. <coughs> so, uh, I'm first of all going to introduce um, our speakers. Um, today we have uh, Peter Schalk, uh, who held the Professorship of History uh, and Religion at Uppsala University, Sweden. Uh, though he is now retired, uh, he keeps his many research interests in religious expressions in intra- and interstate conflicts in South Asia and Southeast Asia alive. Uh, he has been engaged in Tamil studies since the 1970s and started his fieldwork in Sri Lanka in 1970. Professor Schalk uh, was behind the very productive exchange uh, program between Jaffna University and Uppsala University since um, the 1970s. Um, Anne Gall uh, is currently teaching assistant at the University of Limerick uh, where she also completed her PhD on the trajectory of contemporary Sinhalese nationalism in 2017. Uh, she teaches courses on conflict, development, and peace building, and her research interests include nationalism studies, peace, and conflict uh, studies, critical discourse analysis, uh, and politics in Sri Lanka. Uh, Dr. Gary Nathan is the founder and director of the Politics of Sexual Violence Initiative, a global initiative examining the impact of rape on women's political identities and a visiting research professor at the Colin Powell Center for Global and Civic Leadership at City College, New York. She's currently the founder and director of a new program under this initiative, Beyond Identity, a gendered platform for scholar activists. She's also currently a senior scholar at um, the Center for Political Conflict, Gender, and People's Rights at the University of California uh, and the creator of the Female Fighter series at Guernica Magazine. Uh, she received her PhD in political science from the University of California, Los Angeles, uh, entitled Why Women Rebel? Understanding Female Fighters uh, in the LTTE, which received uh, the Gene and Irving Stone Award for Innovation in Gender um, Studies. Okay, um, I'm going to speak um, first, uh, um, and I'm going to ask all speakers um, that we should try and stick to a 15-minute um, time slot, uh, um, maximum 18 uh, minutes, and I'm going to try and stick to that uh, myself as well. Um, I'm speaking on role of identity, particularly nationalist identity in war, conflict, uh, and violence. I'm going to be focusing on singular nationalism. Uh, and key um, to my understanding of nationalism is to understand nationalism as a social order. Okay, I'm going to start with a, a vignette. Uh, recently, uh, there has been a claim that there's been a resurgence of singular Buddhist nationalism in relation to the attacks on Muslims in both 2017 and 2018. Uh, and um, with this focus on this kind of new spate of attacks, um, three uh, interlocking dynamics 
uh, um, are engaged. Um, it's, so three elements are seen to be uh, um, responsible, if you like, um, for this resurgence. One is the role of singular Buddhist ultra-nationalist organizations like the Bodhubala Sena, Singular Ravaya, uh, their leadership, also business interests, and the role of politicians, uh, especially around the Mahindra Rajapaksa coterie, in stoking anti-Muslim violence and utilizing these um, organizations. Uh, and that this, uh, these are key elements in the reproduction of singular nationalism. But I think there's a problem here in this framework. Uh, and I see this problem as threefold. First of all, um, when we talk about resurgence, singular nationalism has never gone away. Singular nationalism has a long-term, it's a long-term social dynamic. Secondly, um, the view of power uh, uh, in this perspective, you know, that politicians, business interests, etc., uh, utilize uh, nationalism, and that's how nationalism gets reproduced. This is a very instrumental uh, understanding of nationalism as something that is manipulated. It's a tool. Okay, and th this again leaves out the socially diffuse um, dynamic of nationalism as a form of social order. Uh, it also sees singular nationalism as a, a particularist phenomenon. Whereas this form of nationalism has been um, reproduced between interlocking global and local dynamics, uh, which stem right back to the colonial period and the reproduction of this unitary state structure in Sri Lanka. So um, what I really want to argue is that, um, that we need to go beyond this perspective that sees Sangha, politicians, business interests as responsible for manipulating people into violence. Uh, that they use nationalism as a flag or device for attaining other rationalist or material self-interested goals. Again, this is an instrumental framework uh, and we need to go beyond it. And this is actually a mainstream way of understanding nationalism that has uh, a, a long provenance. Uh, and it's actually um, become a classic post-Cold War model of the way that conflict is engaged. So various writers like Paul Brass, Paul Collier, St Status Kalaras, in their work, also see um, the role of identity in violence as instrumental. Uh, and in this, grievance claims, grievance claims, for instance, in the Sri Lankan context of the Tamil people, get... Um, they're undermined and disqualified. But if we understand nationalism as social order, the grievance claims are central. And this is because in the instrumental framework, it's, you know, politicians, business interests are using uh, nationalism as a device to achieve other interests, okay? And this leaves out the social dynamic. So we need a different account of the nexus between identity, power, and conflict. Uh, and indeed, conceptualization of all these areas, if we're to make sense of singular nationalism and its role in dynamics of violence, uh, direct and structural law systemic. It's not that instrumentality doesn't occur in the use of nationalism, it does. But um, this reproduces a social embedding that has gone back, right back to the 19th century. So that the problem is that instrumentality itself, which is ultimately an elite model, doesn't help us to explain the forms of violence that pertain to social orders. There are at once formations of peace, security, violence, and subjugation. A form of hegemonic social order, so a dominant social order, which um, creates a hierarchy places a singular population at its apex and subordinates others, Tamils, Muslims, as minorities, and engages in often exterminatory violence against those who are perceived to resist or threaten that order. And you can see these dynamics at work in Sri Lanka. As our previous speaker 
said also in Burma. So you can see actually that Burman Buddhist uh, majoritarianism, uh, singular Buddhist nationalist majoritarianism create this, creates this hierarchic form of social um, order. Uh, and so this, an understanding of this takes us beyond a purely instrumental framework because it understands actually the socially diffuse nature of the way nationalism is reproduced through diverse practices. Uh, and this goes beyond elites. It's spread through subaltern actors. Because instrumentalism doesn't tell us why nationalism, singular Buddhist nationalism, has resonance. Why, why does it resonate? Why do politicians even use it instrumentally? We need to understand how followers uh, respond, and why do they respond to this particular kind of discursive an ideological dynamic. So um, this social order serves to consolidate resonance, okay, and it does this by hegemonizing nationalist order across class, region, gender, and other fissures, creating this kind of dominant form of social order and its hierarchies. Uh, and it does this in a, an enduring way. It does it in Sri Lanka, and it does it through uh, Burman Buddhist um, nationalism in Myanmar. And it's not just elites that reproduce these practices, um, but people are embedded in these practices in the sense of global historical processes uh, in terms of colonialism, anti-colonialism, labor struggles, for instance, in the 19th century uh, that took on, a, at times, a Buddhist nationalist um, logic, uh, operates through education, uh, um, as well as Anne will be talking about shortly. Uh, works through, has worked through development practices, colonization schemes, settlement schemes, uh, constitutional practices, and in terms of everyday um, practices, symbolism, and culture, uh, what Billy calls a kind of banal nationalism as well. So what we need to do is actually stop reducing nationalism to this local, particularist, elite-centric discourse. Okay, because if, you know, if we do that, we can begin to understand also how a range of subaltern actors, uh, including the JVP, and then some of these newer um, nationalist uh, uh, organizations, also reproduce singular Buddhist nationalism. And actually this heats up um, singular Buddhist nationalism, because it becomes a site of contestation. JVP is a crucial organization in the reproduction of nationalism going back to the 1960s, okay, and in the peace process from 2002 to 2006 was one of the key actors in mobilizing against that um, process. So actually nationalism also has a, a kind of fluidity, a contestation, because the JVP also held up its own nationalism as a form of authenticity uh, against the elites. And this heats up um, the singular uh, Buddhist nationalist majoritarian dynamic. So how is the problem, if you like, of seeing nationalism as instrumental uh, or uh, in this, these mainstream um, frameworks come about? Well, partly it's because identity's role is not clearly understood per se. What, what we instead see underlying nationalism, that it's always about these kind of rationalist, materialist goals that politicians are seeking power, they're seeking resources, and we miss out this social order dimension. And this operates through a kind of dualism. We, we kind of disqualify the discourse as an ideology of singular nationalism, we say it's never about that, it's really about these other things. Okay, and this is problematic, okay, because actually this again misses out the social order dimension. And part of this is actually the way social sciences are structured, right? And the tendency actually um, to obscure the role of identity, issues of race, color. Uh, and this operates across many uh, different communities and get disqualified 
this has actually emerged, as I don't have time to explore this, through a kind of Eurocentricity, um, in which, for instance, uh, many Western states are in denial of their own nationalism. This gets projected onto other communities. Nationalism also gets demonized within things like globalization theory. And Sudra and I will talk about that a little bit later on this afternoon. But this is beginning to break down. We see like Brexit, Trump, etc., in the current moment. So I'm going to kind of conclude uh, with some recommendations that we need a good understanding of nationalism unless we have that, unless we have a fuller understanding of nationalism, there's a, a failure to recognize that nationalism is not just a particular internal dynamic, that it's something that's been reproduced, for instance, between the interaction between colonial power, international actors, uh, in um, reproducing an alignment with singular nationalism and this reproduction of a unitary state. Also, it's not simply attributable to actions by select elites, but reproduces this historically hierarchic social order. So a key um, aspect of our engagement um, as activists is actually how to counter that hegemony, all right, and that it's not just instrumental. And I think that's uh, one of the key things that Suda uh, and I will continue with when we talk about this further this afternoon. I'm going to hand over um, now to our next um, speaker, um, Peter. I want to thank the organization here for having invited me for the second time. It is 20 years ago since we met. But um, I'm very happy to see known faces, old friends, and make new friends during these days. I'm going to speak about a difficult subject with a terminology which is a little artificial, huh? because I had to summarize 14 pages, and so you will get a handout to make it easier to follow. The headline of my presentation is The Ideological Construction of Singhala Buddhist Ethno-Nationalism by Semantic Displacement. Let me first uh, point out one thing of a former speaker who rightly emphasizes the, necess the necessity of a uh, study of long durée, of a long historical perspective, which makes it evident that the present atrocities against the Muslims is only a part of a long uh, history of atrocities. Huh? When I started in 1970, I took over from my teacher, Heinz Bechert, who studied at that time uh, militant Buddhist movements from the 1940s onwards. So I continued with the study in 1970s, and I could list more than 100 Singhala Buddhist militant movements. Huh? Not all were did directly violent, but it gave me the impression that there is a continuity. Of course, we can go further back to the colonial period where much of the inspiration has come for the present time, and also to the Wangsik tradition, the tradition from the chronicles, huh? the Mahavangsa, the deeper Wangsa, and all these things which were very anti Tamil. Huh? So, um, with this long perspective, uh, we get another impression of the, imp of the 
strength of this uh, ethno-nationalism. Singular Buddhist ethno-nationalists rationalize the ownership of the territory of the unitary state by retrieving nationalist and or Buddhist concepts from the past of the anti-colonial struggle in large parts large parts of Asia. For example, the term Bhumiputra, son of the soil, uh, it is the soil where the Buddha allegedly trod three times. In the Mahavangsa it is told that the Buddha flew to Sri Lanka three times. Having been turned against colonials, now the designation Bhumiputra was turned against Tamils. Then we have another concept, uh, it is in Pali, Eka Chakra, one umbrella. It is a metaphor for the unitary state now. And um, further on we have the concept of Dhammadipa, which is a canonical concept, true, but it was later translated wrongly as island of the Dhamma. It's a wrong translation. It is no translation at all. Um, it is a kind of uh, transcreation, we usually say, yeah? when um, a translation is fanciful. Um, And um, then the real uh, translation uh, of Dhammadipa means having the Dhamma as light, and it is mentioned in the canonical texts, which are classified as uh, Buddha language. So it has nothing to do with the island at all, huh? because the word Dipa, you know, has the double meaning of island and of light. Huh? But in the uh, ethno-nationalist tradition, they have chosen uh, island for Dipa, huh? which is a wrong translation. Then we have uh, the word Siala Dipa. It doesn't exist in the canon at all. Uh, but it started to be used in the centuries uh, from our time reckoning. So it is an old word, but it was not used as in the present sense. It was a toponym, that means a name of a territory of an island. And this name as a toponym became, so to say, the name of all inhabitants in the island. So all were Singhalas were independent of if they spoke Tamil or Singhala or any other language. It's a demonym. No? And it was used as a demonym in the historical tradition. But in the modern tradition this has been made into an ethnonym. That is uh, the Singhalas are one specific group against the Tamils who are not Singhalas. Huh? So we have this change from toponym to ethnonym and then uh, again what is happening nowadays is that this ethnonym, so to say, is expanded over the whole island. So the Singhalas alone shall be in this island. Huh? So then this eponym becomes a demonym again huh? uh, as a final creation of so-called harmony where no other minorities exist in the island. Huh? So these modern translations can be described as transcreations or as semantic displacements. Um, they are pushed ahead and correspond 
to political religious interests. In the Chronicles, we also find an allusion to a list of 16 places that the Buddha allegedly has visited, including Nagadipa and the Tamil North. All these uh, Buddhist conceptual rationalizations are instrumentalized for the achievement of a political aim, namely the unitary state. Uh, this is done by a singular Buddhist ethno-nationalists. I want to uh, state here clearly that I do not talk about Buddhism. I speak about a special group within Buddhism, namely political Buddhists. And then you have Buddhist politicians, which is different. They try to transfer Buddhist values into society as much as uh, Christian politicians try to transfer Christian values in society. Huh? And then we have the renouncers, huh? those who renounce societies at all. So political Buddhism is only one third of Buddhism. Huh? So um, please don't um, generalize uh, Buddhist aid to nationalism over the whole sector. Huh? Now, they call their own ideology the Jataka Chintanaya. You know all this, national ideology. Yeah? Uh, and then there's another word, which is very interesting, a, a self-representation. Um, self it is Singhalatva. Singhalatva was popularized by Nalin de Silva, who is one of the best-known... Um, ethno-nationalists um, in the modern history. Yeah? And he coined this, he didn't coin it, he popularized it. And he appealed to our understanding of what Hindu Twa is. Huh? So he made, a, so to say, an analogy to Hindu Twa, Singhala Twa. Huh? And you all know what Hindu Twa is, so I don't have to go into this. Now, this ideological program incites 